Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. For our last Olympic story, I figured why not end it with an American? Today we head to the golf course to talk about the first American female to win an Olympic gold medal that she had no idea about. Margaret Abbott. Let's get started. Margaret Ives Abbott was born on June 15, 1878 in Calcutta, now Calcutta, British India. She was the daughter of Charles Abbott, who was a wealthy American merchant, and Mary Perkins Ives. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to know her father because he died that next year in 1879. Because of his sudden death, her mother moved Margaret and her siblings to Boston. Her mother was a great writer, even writing and publishing a novel called Alexia in 1889. When they moved to Boston, she got a job as a literary editor with the Chicago Times. So because of that job, when Margaret was a teenager, her mom moved to family again, this time to Illinois. It was while living in Chicago that Margaret took up golf at the Chicago Golf Club in Wheaton. Now, it's late 1800s, right? This is a time when women weren't even allowed to wear pants. So sports were restricted in really stupid ways. And this is going to be a bit of an explanation, but trust me, this next few minutes is worth it. Okay, now, I had to look up as to why women were restricted in a lot of sports. I already knew the sexism part. That part was easy. But I couldn't help but think that there had to be more to it. And boy, was I not disappointed with how stupid we humans, mainly men, were. Oh my God. Before 1870, sports for women were more recreational than competitive, and there really weren't any rules. In the 1800s, a dominant belief among humans, the most intelligent species on the planet, according to humans, was that the human body had a fixed amount of energy. And if this energy was used for physical and mental tasks at the same time, it could end really badly, like, we could die. I kid you not. Look this up. It was amazing for me to find out. Sports like showboating, swimming, and horseback riding were seen as fashionable, but women were encouraged to not exert themselves because such kind of physical activity for women were especially hazardous because during menstruation, women were periodically weakened says some dude named Dr. Edward Hammond Clark in his 1874 book, Sex in Education or A Fair Chance for the Girls. Yep. <laughs> this book, of course, was ridiculous and caused a lot of outrage and debated about the capacity of women for physical activity. Oh, I need to drink water. When I hear stuff like this, like I just get like, Ugh. this dude said basically, and I kid you not, that muscle and brain usage needs to be reduced during menstruation. And he got that stupid idea because he manipulated science to reinforce a very established dogma that was around for way too many years that basically, despite repeated examples to the contrary, women were perfectly fine to do sports physically and mentally at the same time. Cause flippin' duh. Look, sometimes when you're on that cycle of the month, you literally feel like you can't do anything, but we still can do stuff. <laughs> there are things like aspirin, cause we keep on going, even though the cramps that we get are as painful as a heart attack. I swear to you, it's true. But it's because of that really stupid dogma that women couldn't do any sports. Luckily, as more and more women wanted to be involved in physical activity, they wanted to become more competitive. By the late 1800s and early 1900s, women began forming their own informal athletic clubs, and sports like croquette, tennis, bowling, and archery became very popular clubs in New York and New Orleans. And many men's clubs allowed women to participate in separate activities. However, it wasn't until Title IX was passed in 1972 that protected anyone and everyone from discrimination that women were finally allowed 
to participate in as many competitive sports as they wanted to. Took a couple hundred years for the U.S., but hey, we did it. USA. Women can't do sports because women can't do physical and mental activity at the same time. What? When it comes to golf, golf clubs did allow women to play, but only if they were accompanied by a man. Why? I don't know. Golf was something Margaret and her mom played together, which I'm sure Margaret loved. Margaret was five foot 11 inches tall, which was really tall for her generation and a little shy, but she was a quick learner and a fierce competitor. Her first coaches were amateur golfers H.J. Wiggum and Charles McDonald, and Margaret went on to win several local tournaments. An article in the Chicago Inter-Ocean in 1898 said about Margaret, quote, Margaret Abbott possesses a natural talent for the game. Miss Abbott plays golf with exceptional grace and looks exceedingly well on the links. Her drive is of considerable length and on the green, she is entirely at ease, end quote. And predicted that she would become one of the best golfers in the United States. That's what we call foreshadowing. During her younger years, Margaret established a very impressive record for herself. She played with the Chicago Golf Club in 1897 and 1898. And as the 1898 golf season came to a close, Margaret got second at the McDonald tournament and won a subscription contest on Lynx Course, which is basically a natural terrain golf course that is not man-made because all golf courses are man-made. I'm just saying, don't debate me on that. On June 2nd, I'm sassy today. On June 2nd, 1898, the first ladies day at the Chicago Golf Club of the season, Margaret won the Deering Club contest with a score of 60 on a nine hole course. On that same day during a playoff for something called the Hamlin Prize, she scored another 60 score and won. Her prize was a freaking gold belt. I can't find a picture of it. All I'm gonna say is, I hope it looks like the WWE one. Make it a cool looking belt. Ooh, maybe it's made out of gold golf balls. That'd be cool. After a second place win at a local golf event, on June 10th, 1898, she won the S.H. Graves contest on the Wheaton course. During the remainder of the 1898 summer, Margaret competed in no fewer than five ladies and mixed foursome matches. Her highest finish was with her coach, Charles, when they placed second at the Kramer contest. By the fall of 1898, she won the driving contest, driving golf, the drive golf thingy, not car driving, because women weren't allowed to do that. On the first day of a four-day tournament specifically for women at the Owensa Golf Club, by 1899, she had won two handicaps, which basically is a number that measures a golfer's ability or potential, and that number is used to allow players with different talent levels to compete against the other. I believe so, please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know golf. And better plays have lower scores, so she's freaking good. Again, if I'm wrong, please correct me in the comments. I don't know golf. <laughs> Like many young American women that live in upper society, Margaret spent a lot of time in Paris to learn about culture and art. In late 1899, Margaret and her mother traveled to Paris, specifically so that Mary could research and write a travel guide that would be called A Woman's Paris, a handbook of everyday living in the French capital. While she was doing that, Margaret was studying with Auguste Rodin, a French sculptor that is generally considered to be the founder of modern sculpture, and Edgar Degas, who was a famous French impressionist artist who did pastel drawings and oil paintings. In 1900, Margaret and her mom, who was a powerhouse in golf herself, heard of a tournament at the prize of the town of Kumchin in a newspaper ad. And it's from that ad that Mary and Margaret, unbeknownst to them, became one of the 22 women to play in the 1900 Olympic Games. A newspaper ad. A newspaper ad, and they're in the Olympic Games. Love that. Now remember, the Olympics were in adjacent to the Paris World's Fair. So the Olympics were a sideshow, an add-on. And the sports were considered, I didn't realize this, as demonstrations. Can you imagine Olympic Games today as demonstrations? 
The Olympics were so unknown and, may I say, unimportant that Margaret thought that she was just playing in a small local tournament. <laughs> Again, she entered this event because she was in Paris, played golf, and there so happened to be a tournament close to her that she found in a newspaper ad. And I found out the Olympics were called Exposition Competition and Paris World Fair Competition. The name Olympics weren't even attached to it. Before I move on, I learned more of what sports were in these games, and it's awesome. Besides the obvious track and field, swimming, horses, cycling, there was also tug of war, which you know is not too weird. Yeah, that can get pretty competitive. Fishing, firefighting, kite flying, small, medium, and large events, hot air ballooning, two things. One, yes. And two, fun fact, the Olympic flame, which is also really freaking cool looking thing, that is a cauldron. And the flame isn't a flame. The flames are eco-friendly, water, air, combining, cool, green science flame. And it looks like that because the first hot air balloon flight in history was in Paris in 1873. I am a nerd. You're welcome for that random fact. Let us continue. <laughs> there was pigeon shooting, pigeon racing, and motor car racing. Which isn't too weird. You know, sure, okay. Olympic event, whatever. But the events were called fire truck racing, taxi racing, and delivery van racing. In the delivery van racing, I hope that they need to like actually like make stops, like delivering things. It's not just like an around the track thing. Make it interesting. They have to deliver milk as fast as they can. The event took place from October 2nd to the 3rd. The men went first to playing 18 holes and women went last to playing nine holes because you know, we don't want to put too much strain on women. <laughs> and 22 golfers competed, eight of them being from the United States. The men's round ended with American Charles Sands winning gold. That next day, the women were up. The event attracted a rather large and overly enthusiastic crowd, and the tournament was held at the Kumping Golf Club, which was established pretty fast. I liked tennis. They found that host place pretty fast. <laughs> the women who competed weren't athletes. They were socialites that were studying or vacationing in Paris. Again, just some average Betty just entered the freaking Olympics through a newspaper ad insane dressed in a long sleeve shirt full length skirt and a stinking cute hat 22 year old margaret dominated the event she was tactical consistent and a fierce competitor and she went on to come in first with a score of 47 strokes two strokes less than pauline witter who got second with 49 strokes that day, on October 3rd, 1900, Margaret became the first American female golfer to win Olympic gold. <laughs> now, her mom was no pushover. Remember, she played in the event too, and she tied for seventh with a score of 65 strokes. This event is the first and only time a mother and daughter competed at the same Olympic event. <laughs> When Margaret won, she wasn't given a medal. Remember, medals wouldn't become a tradition of the Olympics till the 1904 St. Louis Games. So the top three winners got rectangular medals while the rest got cups and trophies. Margaret got a Saxton porcelain bowl mounted in chiseled gold. Might have looked like this. Not a gold medal, but I mean, okay, it's cute. I'll put some fruit on it. She brought it back to Paris and just continued with life. She won the Olympics, the first one, first one with women ever, won it, got a bowl, just went back to life. But her victory was published in an article in the Chicago Tribune on October 7th, 1900. And that's it. Those are her Olympics. Look, I know that all these Olympic talks have been just very brief in their whole story, but that's kind of what the Olympics were. They were just this thing that happened because nobody knew what Olympics were, really. And life just continued on. Olympics. 
Now, before we move on with Margaret, I have to tell you this. Believe it or not, I believe it because golf needs a stupid amount of land. After the 1904 Olympics, golf was dropped. Golf disappeared from the Olympic Games for 112 years, only coming back at the 2016 Rio Summer Olympics. And since then, golf has been a part of the Olympics. Golf was supposed to be in the 1920 Belgium Games, but like, nobody entered. <laughs> so they went, never mind. After the games, Margaret stayed in Paris and in 1901 won a women's golf French championship and later that year returned to New York City. In 1902, she met American humorist, journalist, and writer Finley Peter Dune and they would marry on December 10th, 1902 in Chicago. They later settled in New York and had four kids, three sons and a daughter. One of their sons, Philip Dune, became a screenwriter, film director, and producer, and worked with 20th Century Fox, making movies like How Green Was My Valley, David and Bathsheba, and The Anagony and The Ecstasy. Philip later said that his mom said that she won at the Olympics because, quote, all the French girls apparently misunderstood the nature of the game scheduled that day and turned up to play in high heels and tight skirts, end quote. She basically just said that their outfits are ugly. Their outfits weren't fetch. <laughs> Margaret continued to play golf at the Shinnecock Hills Golf Club in New York. The family later moved to Connecticut where she spent the rest of her days. Margaret did continue to play golf, but it's unclear if Margaret ever competed seriously in golf again because of a hurt knee she got after a fall off a bike when she was a young child. And in her old age, it must have just crept up on her. Margaret Eyes Abadoon died on June 10th, 1995 in Greenwich, Connecticut at the age of 76, five days before her 77th birthday. Obviously, unfortunately, Margaret's fame went no further than the Olympic Games, games she never even knew she participated in. And after that, domestic life called to her and she became an average person and faded into obscurity. And she might have stayed there if it were not for Dr. Paula Welch, a professor at the University of Florida who specialized in the Olympics and sports history. She researched Margaret for a good decade and really learned about her when she was able to track down Margaret's surviving relatives who until she just showed up at their front door never even knew their relative was an American Olympic champion. But I mean if Margaret didn't know how would her family know? Still freaking crazy to think about. Philip wrote an article in Golf Digest in 1984 titled My Mother the Golf Olympian. In it he wrote quote it's not every day that you learn your mother was an Olympic champion, 80 odd years after the fact. The champion herself had told us only that she had won the golf championship of Paris, end quote. Thanks to Paula's rediscovery of Margaret's accomplishments, in 2023, Margaret was inducted into the Illinois Golf Hall of Fame. And because of her, we even know Margaret existed because in the early Olympics, they didn't really keep records. And the records they did keep sucked. Though Margaret had no idea she was in the Olympics, she is a pioneer and a title holder. See, by the 1904 Olympics, A, women's golf was dropped, and B, really after those games, golf wasn't an Olympic sport. So for the next 116 years, Margaret was the only female golf Olympic gold medal holder. <laughs> She was the reigning Olympic golf champion for over a century. <laughs> and till the 2020 Tokyo Olympics when American Nellie Korda won gold, Margaret was the only American to win gold in golf at the Olympics. <laughs> it's nuts. Margaret is also the youngest American female to win gold in golf. She was 22 when she won. <laughs> A total of 60 women are competing in golf in the 2024 Paris Olympics. And though we don't know who has won, medals will be given out for the women tournament tomorrow. All of them have Margaret to thank for not only paving the way for them, but for being the first, the longest, and the greatest. 
There you go. The story of Margaret Abbott, the first and until four years ago, the only female American golfer to win gold in the Olympics. Isn't that crazy? She was the, she, she is, not was, she is the longest reigning champion of golf in the Olympics that she didn't even know about Olympics. I'm sure she didn't even know what Olympics were. When you think of it like that, you really realize the Olympics weren't as massively and widely desired as they are today. And I hope you have learned through these last three women of Olympics that, yeah, they were in the Olympics, but since it was just kind of a small part in their life, they did Olympic stuff that they didn't really even know about and just kind of went on with life. Just like with Helene, Charlotte, and Margaret, it was just a thing that they just did. And then they just went on with life. It wasn't a coveted thing that it is today. If you learned something today, and I really sure hope you did, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And while you're down there, please leave a friendly comment. I hope you have enjoyed the Olympics. Tell me your favorite Olympic moment. Mine personally is this picture in just a nutshell. Like, that's just amazing. Before I go, I am starting to burn out a bit. And so I'm going to take the next week off. May, might go into two weeks, depending on if my own workload outside of this gets crazy or not. And if things change, make sure you have the bell notifications turned on so you can get an update from my community post. But until then, don't be well behaved. You just might make history. See you next time, guys. And enjoy the remaining Olympics and the closing ceremonies. Coming at you live.